So I thought as we did last week, you know, we would start a little bit uh, with the, you know, since we're all familiar, we'll do just the basic um, <laughs> teaching prayers, the, the refuge, four immeasurables, short length, and just the mandala, because you requested that last week, Be So we'll do that again, along with, the, you know, just visualizing Shakyamuni Buddha, just to prepare our minds. So let's just take you know, uh, just coming into the breath and the body, however it takes to get yourself settled in the body, because we're going to do about 10 minutes of prayers and just motivation meditation. Just breathing and connecting in, doing a quick scan of the body from the crown all the way down through the body. Some breaths just to release and relax any tension after the day. And in that space, just take a moment to connect with your own motivation. What comes up when you think about your own motivation? So um, on top of that, you know, generally, you know, this course is on the essence of Tibetan Buddhism. So really the essence is, the essence of our practice is to keep uncovering these different levels of truth in our own experience. Satisfaction, confusion that's going on in our mind right now, you know. to recognize the causes of those. As we discussed last week, karma and delusion, to start to recognize how karma functions in our mind, you know, how we create causes continually on a regular basis that's creating different causes of um, happiness or suffering now and in the future, how we create that and how the internal process goes in our mind. And also start to connect with the goodness in our mind, this potential we have for liberation, you know, to liberate our minds for karma, contaminated action, and to liberate our minds from delusion. You know, the main one that everything sprouts from, anger and attachment, they all sprout from ignorance. This kind, the same... Um, wrong view, this obscured view, we have a reality. This obscured view we have of ourselves, how we exist, and how other phenomena exist. So this is really the heart of the matter, you know, to get to that point somewhere, step by step, peeling away the layers of delusion, confusion, in the mind and awakening this potential that we have for liberation, for peace, for wisdom, a wisdom that overpowers the ignorance in the mind, you know, the wrong view of reality. That needs to be awakened. And it's a step-by-step -step process. We can't do it immediately, as most of us have gathered right now. and inspiring ourselves that it's definitely possible we have all the seed we have this innate potential for wisdom it's the nature of our purest mind 
but it needs to be uncovered. It needs to be slowly peeled away by chipping away at the heavier delusions right now for us, at anger and attachment, maybe pride. So there are other delusions that are kind of more obvious to us now, right now, perhaps, in the ignorance. But either way, as we chip away at one, we're always chipping away at the others, you know. And so the purposes of these practices, like taking refuge for immeasurables, is to awaken and start to overpower uh, the presence of the delusions, you know. So they help to change. It's a mind that we have um, and access them, you know. So access what we call Buddha nature within us. Prayers and mantras, meditations, kind of wake up those more subtle parts of us that we're not in connection with day to day and empower, you know, our potential for wisdom. To over to gradually develop this mind to body cheetah, as we mentioned in the prayer here. This ability, this skill that will develop to really enlighten. what we're doing in the Buddhist practice, day by day, minute by minute, we're trying to develop this within our hearts and minds. So we, you know, to start the practice, to get some inspiration, a stream of inspiration, for our kind founder, we recognize, uh, we visualize in the space before us. Or just feel the presence, you know, our kind founder, Shakyamuni Buddha, seated on this fragrant lotus sun and moon cushion, all made of translucent light. And there's a golden body. He has this golden body uh, adorned with the fully the robes of a fully ordained monk seated in the lotus posture, just radiating peace, you know, radiating the quality of the fully awakened mind, you know, that which is developed totally in wisdom and compassion. Our, that's our ultimate goal. So he's radiating that quality. The golden colour kind of coming from him shows the wealth of his inner realisations, you know, the purity and wealth of the fully developed mind. He is in essence our spiritual teacher and asks, We imagine our friends and family, all sentient beings around us, all together connected with the same, being under the same circumstance, you know. We're the same in that we are under the control of karma and delusion. And we're the same that we have this fully, you know, we have this potential to develop our fully awakened state. Not just the humans, the animals, the spirits, but we visualize them all in human form together. Vast, you know, vast, infinite, limitless sentient beings. And together we take outer refuge in the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. And we also take this inner refuge um, of knowing, having confidence in our ability to awaken that fully enlightened state. You know, we have the seed and the potential. So we'll chant twice in Tibetan, once in English. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma and the Supreme Assembly by my merits of generosity and so forth. May I become a Buddha to benefit transmigratory beings. And we'll just recite each verse and take a moment. 
for your own reflection on that. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. So I also find it useful to think, may I, <laughs> and all sentient beings, if that's helpful for your mind, you know, to wish it for yourself, including yourself. It's in the text. But you can also see again in your heart like that if it's helpful. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings never be separated from the happiness that knows no suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free of attachment and hatred for those held close and distant. And then we'll do the refuge, uh, the short mandala. So we'll chant it in Tibetan and write, just read it in English so we know the meaning. This ground, anointed with perfume, strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon, I imagine as a Buddha land and offer it. May all transmigrated beings enjoy this pure land. Yidam Guru Radna Mandala So we have visualized Shakyamuni Buddha receives our mandala offering in his heart. You know, we create lots of we create extra merit, you know, by offering the universe all its contents, as well as our possessions, our body, speech, and mind, everything beautiful we offer to well, Buddha in the space before us. And um, <clears throat> then feeling he's pleased where we practice a refuge for uh, four immeasurables and mandala offering. Uh, we chant a few, the mantra, you know, to get, again, to, to gather a stream of blessings, the wisdom, the omniscient wisdom, the fully developed compassion of Buddha is all embodied in this mantra. What yellow light and nectar coming from Shakyamuni Buddha's heart and entering our body, speech and mind, our gross body, our subtle body, just fills our whole being with this yellow light and nectar, purifying negativity, sweeping away our obstacles and blessing us with his qualities, enlightened qualities of body, speech and mind. We chant together. <laughs> Maha minaye soham Taya ta mine mine Maha minaye so Taya ta soham Taya ta mine Maha minaye soham Taya ta o mine mine Maha minaye soham Taya ta o mine mine Maha minaye soham Taya ta o mine mine Maha minaye soham Taya 
maha minaye soha taya tao soha taya tao mene mene maha minaye soha Taking a moment to feel the energy, the mantra, the visualization, the light, just filling our body, purifying us, the light waking up. Teachings on a deeper level, you know, a clearer level in our own experience. And Shakyamuni, very pleased our practice, accepting to guide us, protect us for suffering, the causes of suffering, be with us until we've achieved our fully enlightened state. We try to feel that guidance, that protection, that presence with us in every moment. It dissolves into a small ball of golden light. The golden light comes to our crown. And slowly, again, moves down through our crown, through our body. It's filling us up again with golden radiant light. The light, inspiration and wisdom. Feel the deep presence of the gurus, the Buddhas all the holy beings embodied in um, Guru Shakyamuni Buddha, all guiding us on the path to enlightenment. They have this quality, awakened consciousness, uh, enlightened mind is always there, it's always present. We just need to connect, we need to awaken, open up and receive their blessings, their guidance, their protection in every moment. It's always there. And again, by listening and reflecting on these teachings, may it allow me to be not just um, awaken my own mind, develop my own mind, but may whatever I learn or develop, I understand, feel for the teachings, may be able to, may it bring benefit to others and eventually, you know, benefit all beings as vast as space, may I be able to have that quality and realisation within me. Okay, so I tried last week to play this video. I think it's going to work this time. It's just a few minutes. There's a lot of essential extracts of Lama Zopa Rimshi's teachings. Did you ever meet Lama Zopa? Ruth, did you ever meet Lama Zopa Rinpoche? No, no. Um, anyway, we will, I thought, here's a way that you can meet him. what we've a little bit been talking about in the last couple of weeks and what the goal is and, you know, what just really what, what we're talking about. So it's always a blessing to, you know, hear these holy beings. So hopefully this is going to work. <laughs> so uh, we need to be free from the uh, category, um, the previous step compound and suffering. That's the main thing. Oh, that but you see, but uh, Buddhist people, oh, that they maintain thing to be free. Oh, that that. Then by freeing that, then you are free forever from suffering, pain, suffering, change. Oh, then you have ultimate happiness, the liberation forever. Ah, oh, that kind of thing. Ah, that that so. So even the. Uh, even that is uh, so, uh, even free from some of the uh, issues in Iran is not sufficient for for if, for yourself, you see. Ah, uh, believe that of peace for oneself is not enough. Oh, then that's what the that purpose of our, t our taking purpose of human life. 
Odan der one is not even this. Odan de kasor jive jive beneficial for sentient beings. Ah, jive ne cha so kasor he. Ah, so the current with the ah. To free the uh, to free the numberless helping numberless hunger gods numberless animal numberless human being numberless spirit be as well intermediates to cause them to be free from samsara forever. Oh, not only that, not only that, and bring everyone each and everyone from each six realm. Everyone to peerless happiness, total cessation of spiritual completion, completion of realization, sangje, all that. Oh, so oh, oh, you need to that. Mm, oh, that is the, that is the main that is the main purpose of why we are born human beings at this time. Oh, to accomplish that aim. That's the our main aim of our life. Oh, so that's the main aim of this retreat. Ah, ah, and that should be the main aim of our breathing, our eating food, going to sleep, everything. Ah, uh, so so for that. You you need to, for that you need to achieve certain omniscience. Mm. Okay, so there you go. <laughs> it's just to get a wee brief look at Rinpoche, you know, to get that blessing. Um, Bay, did you see there was a message from Namasia that she's having trouble get, clicking on her video? But I don't know if there's much we can do from this time. Pardon. Videos yeah, now it's working. Oh, you're there, Namasya. Okay, that great. Fixed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Good. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. See you now. I just had to click down. You're good there. Okay. So, um, anyway, that was just a little glimpse of Rinpoche. Um, so now I'm going to go back to share, share my, um, share something else, share screen. Back to the slideshow. And up here we go. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, this is <laughs> this is uh, you missed this one last week, Ruth. Rimpishe Rimpishe was very and again this just follows on from what Rimpishe has got a little message here, but Rimpishe was awfully right on cuddly toys, you know, mantras and things like I want to be free from suffering. Very cute things, you know. Because sometimes I think it helps to lighten the mind a little bit because <laughs> some of this material can be kind of, whoa, it's really intense, you know? I mean, because you're really like looking at your stuff, you know? So um, Rimshi used to try and help Westerners, I think, to kind of keep it light. I mean, it's still very serious, you know? We need to get out of suffering, you know? We are obscured. But at the same time, Rimshi tried to kind of, you know, make it joyful too, because we have to have joy in our path, you know? That's what really brings the inspiration. That's what brings the energy. So sorry, I'm just kind of scrolling up now to the the one the one I want to get on to is slide fifteen. Okay. Okay. So, um, so really, last week again, we were just going into. I mean, fortunately, none of this is really new for you, Ruth. So you can just slip into this week again. <laughs> um. We were just still on the Four Noble Truths, you know, just going into the truth of suffering, you know, what that looks like. And I just wanted to start this week again. I did sort of touch on these last week, but just um, again, just as a beginner, it's like, what, what is, you know, these these um, analogies come from the direct realizations, you know, holy beings. These aren't my analogies. <laughs> you know, these are analogies that have come from really enlightened beings, enlightened masters who see very clean, clear the nature of our samsaric experience, you know, uh, the situation we're in. So they always, you know, of course, Milarepa was a great enlightened yogi. He used to write poems. 
um, very succinct poems and sing songs about the nature of samsara for us, you know, because they can really see once they've realized Realize the cessation, you know, the, ex the experience of getting out of it. They see very, very clean, clear what's going on with us in very, you know, succinct ways, you know, with these through these analogies. So here, you know, it says that um, it's like samsara is like honey smeared. I really like this one, you know. Um, I'm sure some of you have seen it before. It's like honey smeared on a razor's edge. We are drawn to it, but then the razor cuts our tongue, you know, so it's like <laughs> Ursa's laughing there, you know, but it's it's not just samsaric pleasures, like, of course, nature is sort of attachment, you know, to pleasure in itself, you know, I mean, everything, I mean, you can even say, you know, in our relationships and, you know, the whole samsara is really like that, you know, it's all pretty much like we, you know, we if we think something looks attractive, but it's it harm, you know, it harms, it comes back and harm. Pain, you know, especially when we approach things with a lot of attachment in our life, you know, it doesn't mean that we can't enjoy, you know, there's a level of enjoyment in our life for sure, you know, but as soon as we sort of get into being attached to things. Um, you know, it, we have this experience, you know, where it just comes back and hurts us, you know. And in reality, you know, is it anything that's kind of, you know, motivated by strong attachment or strong ego, it ends up in pain. You know, it has this nature of pain, just like the razor edge, you know. So this is, you know, of course, we can see some experiences of that in our life. We can feel that sometimes. We don't feel it all the time. But um, I think if we really sort of try to reflect and meditate upon that, we'll see many experiences in our life where we thought something was going to bring happiness and it ended up bringing a lot of pain. Yeah. So this is a little bit, you know, some experience of this ex experience where something looks very, very attractive and then all then it very quickly turns into being some painful experience, you know. Definitely like um, generally samsaric pleasures. But also we can see it in relationships. If we don't approach relationships with a lot of patience, a lot of, you know, concern for the other, you know, <laughs> even in our family, I'm not just talking about partners, I'm talking about in the family, I'm talking about, you know, or we, you know, we look forward to this big family event and then it just goes sideways, you know, because there's a lot of attachment or there's a lot of, you know, you know, self, you know, self wishing stuff for herself out of it, you know, so it's, Basically, you know, anything that's approached with this mind of strong grasping, attachment, or it brings pain, you know. Anything that is approached with a, um, a you know, kind of energy attachment or strong grasping, you know, it ends up being, a, it'll end up being in the nature of pain like the razor. It's also like being in a prison where we never escape from. That one's a little bit different because I think that's more relating to, I mean, it's definitely relating to the grosser types of suffering, you know, these dissatisfactory levels of um, where we, you know, the temporary pleasures, but it's more related to being in this, as again, we looked at last week, the wheel of life, where in the center you have this rim where you have the pig and the two, two, you know, the two other animals, and the pig represents our ignorance, you know. So it's really like being in a place where we don't see that there's something much more attractive out there. When you're in prison, imagine if you're born in a prison and you don't know anything else beyond the walls of the prison. So you probably think it's okay, you know. I mean, you get on with, it. you know, in a prison the food's not that great, but you haven't, you don't know anything else, <laughs> you know. You don't see the sky much. You don't get outside, but you don't know anything else beyond that, you know. So, it's um being in the under the control of ignorance, where we don't see much beyond the temporary sort of pleasures of this life. It's a bit like being in a prison like that, you know. We don't see. And we're not able to experience the blissful, peaceful states of liberation. You know, what they what they really mean, you know, just even in terms of <laughs> a prison in terms of samsaric pleasure. I mean, they say a Buddha mind 
a, a bodhisattva, they experience like all the pleasures, you know, all the, the like the when we make these off, we make all these offerings on the altar, flowers and lights and incense and everything, beautiful waters and food. I mean, even the level of Buddha mind, they can experience food having hundreds of tastes because they've purified all the senses. You know, for us, we have we enjoy a samsaric pleasure and it's like, it doesn't, you know, it's, it's, it's soon, you know, the chocolate cake no longer, it has any much taste or flavor after a while, you know, but for a Buddha, they experience endless bliss from all the sense objects, not just the taste, the touch, the smell, everything has this blissful experience, you know? So for us, we, because we're under the control of ignorance, karma and delusion, we're not able to experience that, you know? So that's kind of like why we're in, they say we're in a bit of a prison, you know? And we're not able to experience the different types and levels of wisdom and compassion and feeling that the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas experience. We're kind of locked into a very strong sense of self, you know, in our world, our small world around us. Make sense? The other one is like having the other thing about being under the control of these three types of suffering that we mentioned in the last class, suffering of the suffering uh, pervades is suffering, uh, the suffering is suffering, and the suffering is change. These different levels of grosser and subtle suffering is like having this, because we're not basically having this pain or toothache or something that we never take care of we just think it's okay we just live with it you know oh well it's okay I'll just live with it you know it's a bit like that when holy beings look at us like we're constantly in the um, this space of beings suffering from a pain you know the pain of ignorance the pain of you know grasping at a strong sense of self the pain of identifying with an ego all the time for a Buddha, that's a painful state of mind. Like we would think, look at someone and say, God, you've got this pain all the time in your tooth. Why don't you take care of it? You know, it's like somebody just doesn't take care of the problem. So for enlightened beings, they look at us with that kind of compassion. It's like, I mean, if we don't want to take care of it, there's nothing they can do, you know? <laughs> but if we start to recognize, oh, wait a minute, I do have this painful problem. I do have this and it's not, it's not comfortable and there's a solution to it then it's like, you know, they can give us a solution. They can give us a medicine. So it's, you know, these are these type of analogies that when the Buddhas look at us, this is what they see. You know, this is the, what they experience. They see when they look at us. So we have to get that insight slowly, slowly into ourselves. You know, this is what's going on. This is how they perceive us. This is the situation we're in. And through you know, study, reflection, meditation, we get a deeper insight into these states of mind, these levels of suffering, actually they are in the nature of pain for me, you know, and I do want to liberate myself from them. And that's really the process of the Buddha Dharma, you know, going deeper and deeper into the insights of anger, attachment, and then slowly getting to understand how ignorance is what operating in our mind is this kind of <laughs> dictator, as Lama Zoparimshi used to say, it's dictating our world. And it's dictating it in a way where it's keeping us under the control of the three levels of suffering. And that's really the purpose of our meditation. There's not really another purpose, you know, it's like, we have to meditate, meditate, listen to teachings, reflect, and really, really deeply start to understand where suffering's coming from within us and keep creating the antidotes to them, you know, keep working on the anger, keep working on the ignorance, keep working on the attachment, how they work through each other and with each other. They're like best friends, you know, they're like buddies. <laughs> And they want to hang on tightly, you know. I mean, they're, they've got a strong hold, you know. But what the Buddha is saying is, you guys, you've, you, if you get out of this, it's like getting out of an ex prison that you've never experienced before, you know. We do have moments of freedom from them, but we've never had complete freedom. <clears throat> we've never got out of that wheel where the death is, you know, controlling us, this wheel of life. You know, we haven't been out yet. And it's hard because we haven't been out yet. 
you know, once you're out of that, you're out. You don't go back in again, you know. <laughs> I mean, once you have direct perception of how you exist, of emptiness, we don't go get stuck back in that wheel. You know, like as we see again, as the Buddha had, the Buddha had depicted, you know, he asked to put this paint. He said, please paint this in the front of monasteries. As again, I mentioned last week, and again, what we do in these teachings is we repeat, sorry if I'm repeating, but repetition is what we need. You know, we need to keep telling our minds <laughs> that they're not quite well, you know, and keep inspiring the mind that there's a, a way out, there's a path out. As we see here, you know, so the Buddha is out of the wheel. We're in the... We're like the pig, the steak, and the pigeon. The pig is our controller. Their main dictator is Lama Zoparim, she should say, that dictates our life. The pig represents the power of ignorance in our mind. That's making this whole wheel go, you know, wheel turn. The pig, and then from the pig comes out attachment and ignorance. And then again, just to go over again, from this, certainly we can create good karma, you know, sometimes, not from anger, but ignorance, if it's empowered by, you know, some kind of motivation, a good heart, we can still create good karma and we can still take ourselves to what these three are, the higher realms of existence. Human, there's a God realm that, you know, Christians would say are what we might say is similar to the Christian experience of heaven, what they talk about in heaven, where you experience endless pleasure, bliss, joy. I mean, that comes from positive karma that we're going to go into a little bit later, you know, positive karma, good actions. It comes from our goodness, you know. It's not liberation. It's simply a rightening of really good karma that we've had, we've experienced, you know, from being a good person, practicing generosity, practicing kindness, practicing good speech, you know, heart, um, helpful speech, uh, being, you know, kind to others, helpful to others, practicing a lot of generosity really brings... Films. And the human realm. <clears throat> so this is symbolized by this white inner, inner hub or spoke here, you know, bringing us up. Even though we're under the power of these three, we can still create good karma that brings us into positive states of rebirth or existence. Similarly, these three can always also create negative karma when we're empowered by strong anger, you know, aversion. That brings us into lower realms of existence. This is the animal realm, you know. This is where the realm of existence that we're able to see. So it's a very powerful, uh, you know, meditation to really think about when you see animals, you know, like, um, you know, to remember that that's a, that's a rebirth that I could potentially experience. You know, my consciousness can take me to that rebirth. And um, even though it looks, you know, for pets, <laughs> it looks really okay, you know. <laughs> you know, I could just hang out and be a cat and, you know, I didn't have to work and have all those responsibilities of kids. And I mean, of course, they have children, they have babies, but, you know, they, it, it's a short time that they take care of their babies. And I mean, in the West, so many people think it's okay to be your cat or dog, you know. But that's so limited because there's very few animals that have that kind of rebirth, as, even as a pet. Most of them are out, and as I mentioned last week, most of them are ba barely surviving. In you know, trying to attack them, get, get use them as food, or just scare them, or, you know, they're always on the... ...into the animal realm. There's only 1%, if that even, I don't even think it's 1%, that actually live as dogs and cats or fish, you know, in, our, in the goldfish tank or whatever, you know. So it's a very, very, um, that's actually a really powerful meditation. I, I don't know if I mentioned last week, but Lama Zoparimshi, sorry, we had, a, we had a meditation retreat here last week on introduction to Buddhism. 
So I was helping to lead the meditations. So um, at one point, you know, we were talking about, some people were asking about Lama Zop Rimshi's life, you know, and um, they said, is it really true that Rimshi didn't sleep? <laughs> and I said, you know, because I lived at Rimshi's house. So, and sorry, I might have said this last week. It was either at the, I think, I definitely said it to the class. I might have said it here. Um, but anyway, either way, it's just something to really think about, you know. Like Rimpishi, and I said, yeah, it's really true, Rimshi. Resting, because even Rimshi's sleeping was very, it wasn't like he got a duvet and kind of put it over his, you know, went into bed. It was more like falling asleep, sitting up. Very occasionally he would lie down, you know. And when someone asked Rinpoche, um, I mean, people asked Rinpoche here and there, why didn't why does Rinpoche not sleep? You know, and one of the one of the um, reasons Rinpoche gave way back in the earlier days, when Rinpoche was very much, um, you know, more of a manifest more a disciple than being in charge of the organization when Lama Yeshi was around alive, Rinpoche spent most of his time in meditation, and Rinpoche said to one of the students. You know, if you could see the mind of an animal, if you could see what was going on in the mind of an animal and thinking that, you know, it's possible I could take rebirth there, you wouldn't sleep. That was Rimshi's motivation for, he so, of course, Rimshi is already a great sage and, you know, holy being a yogi, you know. So he he's probably, he has... Yeah, certainly when I'm in retreat, when I'm not in retreat, I just, you know, go back to my more, mind gets very ordinary. <laughs> but it's interesting just to think more deeply about what really is going on in the animal realm, you know, because we can see that realm. We can't see the human, we can't see the hell, we can't see the preta, but even in the human realm, we can see these types of beings. You know, there's so much, you know, and I mean, right now in Gaza, so many people are starving, you know. Hundreds, thousands, maybe a few million. I don't know the numbers, but it's high, you know. We can see hell beings. There's so many beings living in hellish states in this world, in this realm, you know. So the fortune we have right now to be able to direct our lives, at least to be in a good way, you know, and at least to try and a little bit impact our minds, have an impact on these different types of suffering that's going on in our mind, just to work a little bit on that it's unbelievable the freedom we have to do that you know so these kind of this kind of thought processes give a lot of inspiration to practice certainly for myself and that's why when if we you know when we studied buddhism we study the lamb rim which is going to we're going to study more deeply in the lamb the path you know the discovering buddhism modules you go into each of these aspects and it brings more and more inspiration to practice as we go through more and more how especially So this is, um, anyway, this is, again, just going back to the wheel. I always find it helpful. I, I just find the wheel really helpful. I don't know about Namasia. Do you find that helpful just to look at that wheel and get, because I think some of this material is quite new, you know? So I don't know if looking at the, you know, the sort of, the, this depiction, it does, it just sort of helps, yeah? Yeah, I enjoy looking at it. It's very interesting. I'd yeah. love to pick out all the pictures and, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> very, very intricate. Yeah, and I love the Buddha outside of the wheel, just kind of, you know, being enlightened over there. <laughs> it's it all, yeah, it always is. And what about you, Ruth? Do you find this helpful to look at? I mean, do you have a sort of, sort of already some general understanding of this wheel? I need you. You need. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, it's a little hazy. You know, I haven't really studied this for a long time, yeah. but um, it is it is helpful. Very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. So and you, Urs, what about you? Yes, I've seen it before. And uh... now, when you first look at the Wheel of Life, is there something like, wow, that reminds me of this when I look at the Wheel of Life? <laughs> I find it very complicated. I mean, if you read the explanations, all the different, the 12 stages on the rim yeah. of the wheel and then all the, all the connections, the, the causes and the results. Yeah. And uh, So it's very, very complex, actually. It, it looks like yeah. a simple picture, but it's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> that's why this car course, course I'm just st st sticking to the simple wheels and spokes you know because <laughs> these ones are more basic and you know, you know these are more basic and easy to understand but even just looking at it it reminds us you know that even though we create good karma here this white rim we're still in samsara you know it's not enough you know we need to get three three this one that dictates everything it dictates the whole any thoughts from your side on the wheel of life that sticks out for you when you look at it b she's there oh yeah uh yeah i'm here can i ask why um the um the lord of death that um there's a little one at the bottom here yeah. I think it's um you know what it is? It's he's wearing a tiger skin. You talk about this here, yeah? Yes, yeah. That's just what he he's Yeah, he's wearing. just wearing a tiger skin or loincloth, you know? Okay. So it's just the head of the skin, yeah. Because you, you can see here. Uh -huh. And just um, a lot of these kind of raffle beings kind of wear like snakes and you know <laughs> okay. raffle aspects and it might just be showing the certain power or something, or that um, I'm not quite it is, you know, he's wearing a lion skin and it's a head. So just to mention again, you know, that this outside is the Lord of Death, you know, and this is just showing that right now, what that really means and what we have to I haven't got power over death. So great yogis, great sages, Lama Zopa Rinpoche. I mean, His Holiness even talks about living till 100. You know, His Holiness has said many times he's going to try and live to 113. You know, he won't say explicitly, I have power over death, you know. But basically he has at that level of attainment, you know, these in life. They pass away and they pass away when they feel that they have no longer any you know they're not they've finished their works of this life you know they've finished what they want to benefit in this life so i would even say myself in the experience of lama zoparimshi as many of us students of lama zoparimshi would say that even rimshi he passed away in this very sudden way you know all of a sudden you know but we would say rimshi had control over that you know rimshi decided that they were finished with this you know, they had already decided that they had benefited in this life, their works were finished, and so they decided to pass away. And so again, they pass away in meditative state. So this wheel of life is showing as long as we are under the control of these three here, we have uncontrolled death. And this is Mara, the Lord of Death. So we need to kind of <laughs> overpower Mara in our mind, you know, we need to get control over our own death this is the process and the way that we do it is to realize emptiness as when we realize emptiness when we free ourselves with suffering and the causes of suffering and bring about the realization of wisdom how we exist how phenomena exists in our mind when we have that direct perception then we get out like buddha here in the corner then we are out of this wheel and that's Buddha showing, the moon really shows liberation here. And of course, in the Mayana path, we can go beyond, um, we can also develop our mind beyond liberation to the fully enlightened state, uh, um, enlightenment, which involves developing this um, these qualities of bodhicitta. So this is, um, so yeah, anyway, that's, so it's just, you know, every time you see, that's why it's outside the temple. It's sort of, when you come in, we have also a picture outside the, Gompar Temple here. So when you come in the door, it's like, you have to remember, you know, we're in this process of uncontrolled death and rebirth, you know. But again, as the Buddha's showing, there's a path out, you know. So that's um, back there. And um, so what, what, just, I think we covered most of this last week, but just kind of, just going over again, the main points, um, I think maybe I've I've talked most about this already. So I think what we'll do is we'll go on to the truth of cessation. So again, just clarifying, you know, the truth, the four truths, the truth, the truth 
that the Buddhas and all the holy beings see that there is suffering. We're in this realm of suffering, what that looks like. The truth of the cause, which we saw in the wheel, the main causes are the um, ignorance, grasping at true existence, a wrong view of self, how we perceive other and the reality of phenomena is a mistaken perception. And that is coming from the main cause of suffering, ignorance that pervades our mental consciousness right now, oh, that's it, you know, because when we clear our mind of these three, these delusions, then we're able to perceive, you know, naturally we can perceive um, the nature of consciousness and mind that's clear and knowing and has this potential to realise its own nature. So basically, um, this is shifting into from the understanding the causes of suffering, then what the Buddha taught, the third noble truth, the third truth is that because our nature is not in the, our mind is not in the nature of suffering, it's not, it's not its ultimate nature, then we can liberate our mind as we can free dust from a mirror, we can remove dust from a mirror, the stains on the mind of karma, delusion, are adventitious, they're temporary states of mind as clouds in the sky are, so the potential for everlasting peace and happiness, the potential for liberation, the potential to develop our wisdom, the potential to develop limitless compassion is, is there. You know, we have that seed, we have that. So that's like what we call the good news. You know, that's the positive news. And um, it's very good all the time to, you know, especially if we've been practicing for a long time and we feel like we're sometimes not getting anywhere or we should. connect with the fact that we have this seed of liberation and enlightenment in our hearts and minds you know these other delusions are just temporary states of mind that we are we familiarize with ourselves with but we can unfamiliarize ourselves with so this is basically the truth of cessation the good news you know that we have this potential like um so again, as I said, you know, it's been over to get before, there's no creator other than our own minds, you know. So everything that we are creating with our uh, mind, it, you know, everything that we perceive with our mind right now, basically, I mean, there's different levels of about the nature of reality in mind, but on a basic level, Everything we perceive, and Rimshi always, you know, Lama Zop Rimshi always uh, inspire and keep working on our minds that there isn't a creator other than our own minds. There's nothing that we've that's out there that hasn't come from our own projection or view. It's a bit like a you know a movie you know on a blank screen. We're creating the movie of our world and existence all the time there's nobody else creating it i mean yes it's true we have similar karma as human beings you know we 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 understand we we um we perceive the world as a group together of humans we have similar perceptions of how things exist and how things appear you know but it doesn't mean that that's actually how they concretely exist it feels like that but we do, we have different views. I mean, even, you know, we can see, <laughs> well, in America, a lot of people have very different political views <laughs> about what's right and wrong, you know? <laughs> um, still, we have similar views of, you know, how things appear and exist. But, you know, as the world, I think as we're going into times of degeneration, um, how people per perceive and per view, uh, view what's right and wrong is quite, there's getting bigger and bigger differences in that, you know? <laughs> and that's creating a very, very different reality slowly in this world as well, you know, externally. I mean, one good example for me is to see how we create everything. Really, everything is created by our mind is this example of friend, enemy and stranger. How very quickly someone can appear either as a friend 
you know, if, or an enemy, or how we have this indifferent view of someone, how we feel very closely connected to someone for different, you know, we, we make up different reasons in our mind why someone's a friend. They give us, you know, they give us, you know, they're kind to us. They give us um, presents, you know, they speak nice words or, you know, you have a connection through similar interests, similar, you know, hobbies, similar points of view. So they become a friend, but it's really interesting how, you know, they say something you don't agree with or they do something you don't like or they you, they leave you out at some event or something. And then they slowly shift into being not like an enemy, but the appearance changes in your mind. Yeah. Of that person. Quite quickly. I mean, that can happen like day to day, moment to moment. If you've got kids, they probably very quickly, <laughs> not completely stranger, you know, but even the appearance of, you know, anyone can change very quickly if they say or do something. Very distant to you very quickly. Or if somebody's very kind to you, they become close to you very quickly. They have a softer appearance. Just that alone, I feel like that alone, if I really investigate that process, it's like, oh, wow, the appearance of this person is just coming from my mind. How they appear to me, yeah, certainly due to the power of ignorance, they appear separate, right? Or, you know, everybody appears separate to us something separate out there from our sense of self. That's coming from the root problem of ignorance, the separateness, the, the duality between ourselves and others. That fundamental disconnectedness comes from uh, ignorance because we perceive a self that's separate from someone else. But on top of that, our attachment to pe to friends and family, our anger can create another appearance on top of that. And of course, if we have good-heartedness towards someone, we have a lot of patience, good-heartedness, that creates a softness with others. It creates an appreciation, a closeness with others. When you're patient with someone, when you respect someone, it creates a softer feel a closeness with that person. There's still a separateness, <laughs> but you feel closer because there's a good heartedness. There's a good feeling going on there. You know what I mean? It's making sense. So it's just good to investigate this process in your mind, you know, with other people. What's happening? How do they appear to me when I get upset? Is that a and it's not a nice state of mind when you're angry or you don't, or you just want to ignore someone. You just want to blank them. <laughs> but if we check up, it's not, a, it's not a nice state of mind. It's not a positive virtue state of mind. So we are creating that reality with that person. That is our reality. Similarly, a reality with someone we enjoy, with someone we love and respect, that's a positive reality. We still feel there's a disconnectedness, but it does bring a warmer feeling with that person. When you have compassionate thoughts, kind thoughts, respectful thoughts, you know. So again, this is just an example of how our mind, our delusions, our delusions create pain, distance in the mind. And our positive states of mind, like compassion and patience, respect for others, you know, when we develop that, it creates a human, a more human close feeling. And that feeling feels nicer. Yeah. So we want those positive words. And also when we have that close, warm feeling. Us or they, you know, they have their own stuff, but basically, still, if we have patience for that, that person, it's not just like how we feel, it's like they appear differently to us because we're creating that appearance with our mind. Our environment appears nicer when we have a positive state of mind, when we are loving, compassionate state of mind, our environment's just softer, you know.
if we have a harsh or indifferent state of mind, our environment's more, we feel more disconnected from everything and even ourselves from reality, you know. Indifference is also a, it's also a painful state of mind, you know, it's not feeling anything, but it's actually feeling a lot of pain, separation. So main, mostly what the delusions do is they create a lot of separation in our mind from others and also from really our inherent nature, you know, it keeps us more separated from this inner potential we have for kindness, love, compassion for ourselves and others. So it's just getting more and more, so the more and more we connect with the, those pain, how those states of mind connect pain, uh, create pain, the more we want to develop, the more we want to practice and really keep developing the positive states, the antidotes, you know, kindness, compassion, patience and eventually the more we get in touch with how ignorance is operating in our mind the more we want to keep developing our wisdom it's that's mainly what inspires our ourselves the more we know we feel our suffering the more we want to get out of it the more we feel suffering creates pain in our mind the more we want to create the antidotes the more we want to practice the you know the meditations that bring us out of those states. We just want to free ourselves of them and we want to get liberated from them. And that's really what renunciation means. You know, recognizing slowly, 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 deep, more deeply, deeply, deeply our suffering states of mind. And then thinking, oh my God, you know, this is just painful. This is just, I just don't want to be in this, you know. And you want to, you want to get out of it. You want to get free from it. I mean, anger's an easier one, yeah? To feel that I want to, you know, I want to get out of that, and it does create pain, not just for myself but other people. So um, that's the one that we want, you know. I think that's at least one we can agree on that we need to work on, you know, and not just like major anger, but just agitated states of mind. You know, we can see that that creates pain and suffering, and that's something. I think all, you know, at least at the beginning part of the path, it's like, yeah, I want to get out of those states of mind, you know. So, um, and then as those reduce in them, as anger reduces, then we get a wee bit more of a feeling of attachment, how that operates. And then slowly, when those two are a bit less, we can start to see, get more idea of what's going on with the ignorant state of mind. How am I perceiving just everything in the wrong way? How am I perceiving this duality that's not correct? How is it operating in my mind? And again, and, and as it says at the bottom here, this, um, as I said last week, these notes just really helped me to remember where I am. So, <laughs> because the first week I was trying to like put things up here and then look at my notes and it was too much. So these are my notes, but you know, hopefully they're helpful for you too. So, you know, the more we meditate on and we recognize suffering in our own experience, the other thing that happens is, is we get have less anger. I mean, I noticed that a bit myself in my early years of being a nun. When I first met the path, I thought attachment was my main problem. <laughs> I was like, no, I've got a lot of attachment. I need to work on I mean, it's not that I don't have attachment yet. <laughs> But I always thought, you know, because it's, you know, it's quite hard to see your stuff. I mean, it is. Isn't it hard to see your stuff? <laughs> Everybody else can see your stuff. But we, it's, <laughs> it's hard, you know, oh yeah, I know what's going on with him. He's got a lot of this and she's got a lot of that. Very easy. This is why we do need a good meditation practice. We, you know, we need to listen to the teachings and really see, okay, what's where is this happening for me? Not like, oh yeah, they've got a lot of attachment and anger. I can see that, you know. <laughs> Not it's like I've got a lot. What kind? How much attachment and anger have I got? And and where in my life is it more strong? You know, where does it come up stronger? This is where we need to be very sincere in our practice, and then. When you feel that, um, you know, I'm okay, I've, I've got a little bit less anger now. And I feel, wow, that's nice. That's, you know, usually I would get angry in that situation. But because I've done stuff on my mind. So, yeah, going back to my own experience, you know, I mean, in my early uh, and then, yeah, in my early years, I always thought, yeah, I've got, you know, my problem. I, I don't have so much anger. I thought, you know, <laughs> I've got more attachment. And then one time when I, you know, as a new nun and I was staying at Lama Zoparimshi's house, 
And I remember I was having some, you know, I was having some agitation and difficulty with some, you know, some stuff was coming up, you know, when you're in pre often when you're in the presence of the teachers. Um, you know, of course, it's a great blessing, but because they're like a mirror, you know, they completely reflect your stuff, you know. <laughs> so it's like, you know, there's this blissful experience when you're around them, but when you're around them a lot, of really strongly. And sometimes Rimshi would orchestrate things so that your stuff would come up so you could see it, you know. So I remember I the things were coming up. Um, but, you know, I don't know if I was really how aware I was of it. And Rimshi, um, I don't know, for some reason I was up in the room one day and Rimshi said, sit down for a minute or something. It's not like I would sit there all day in front of the guru. No, no, you were mostly just working all day, you know, and doing your jobs. And and somehow I remember Rimshi said to me, well, anger's the, anger's the one that you need to be careful with. You know, anger, he said that. And I was like, really? I mean, I, I didn't, you know, I was like, I, I didn't, I was, I was always saying, I thought it was attachment. I think I thought in my mind, I thought it was attachment. But actually, as time went on, and I got more clear, you know, I got more, I guess, I, you know, more purification or whatever, I started to see, oh, actually, it is anger that bothers me. You know, it is anger that these other things are coming from, these other problems, these other issues. So I was get, start to get more clear that actually, no, I need to work on my anger more, you know. It wasn't like I got blazing angry and shouting at people and the horns and the, you know, the fate. No, it wasn't like that, but it was a lot of inner, you know, just agitation and that kind of feeling, you know, like you're really bothering me, you know. So so it's, um, so anyway, that was my experience. It takes some time to really see, that's why you have to be like a bit of a spy with your mind, you know, and that's why we really emphasize in this tradition doing purification practices because in the light of purification, it starts to give you space in your mind where you can see your stuff more, you know. You can see how anger is disturbing your mind, you know, how attachment is disturbing your mind. And it gives you the space to slowly get a wee bit a handle on it, you know. So um, I remember... I was in India and I was doing... You know, a lot of, uh, I was very enthusiastic and doing my <laughs> prostrations and, you know, some of my preliminary practices. And I'm like, I'm going to get enlightened, you know. <laughs> you know, I, don't, I was only in my 20s, you know, and that's, that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, I was very enthusiastic. It got me going. And um, and I remember going a teaching with holiness. If you have a little bit less anger, well, that's wonderful. Keep going with the practice. And I thought, what do you mean a little bit less anger? I'm like, I'm going to be, I'll have a lot more than a little bit less anger than 10 years, you know. But either way, somehow that one, you know, I had so many teachings with His Holiness, but somehow that one really stuck. I don't know if many other things stuck, but that one stuck because I had so much kind of like, that can't be right, you know. I mean, that can't be all, you know. But it's very true because I remember, you know, after doing some retreats and everything, I could feel, wow, usually I would, there's definitely, I would have got more agitated in that situation. And this was after like 10, 15 years, but no, I'm I'm able to maintain a level of patience. And it felt, wow, I feel, wow, that's really, and it does, it feels much lighter in your mind, you know, so... It's um, it gives you this possibility that I can, you know, it's definitely possible to free the mind for that. So anyway, um, so yeah, these purification practices do work. <laughs> there has been some impact on the mind. <laughs> anyway, so the truth of cessation. Does anyone have any questions or anything else? Any stories? Anything they want to share? Don't know. We we'll talk about me all the time. <laughs> Any insights on your anger or attachment over the years? Urs? Yeah, you've, you've been practicing for a while. Maybe. I mean, it's, uh, as you said, the progress is slow. I mean, you don't have uh, overnight successes or something. It takes, yeah, months or years to see a difference. So that's, I think that's really true. Yeah, yeah. 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 I 
a daily practice, a, a discipline in your spiritual practice gives some, I mean, I feel it gives a lot of joy, stability, um, you know, it also gives that, you know, do, do you think, you know, f feeling like um, it does take time, but I think just the joy of having, um, you know, met, met these teachings, understanding a little bit how things work in your mind, even if you can't understand it completely, you have the wisdom, you know, you've got this wisdom now for the teachings that, you know, you have to kind of work through, but there's a joy and inspiration for that. Would you feel that? Do you feel that? Maybe, Bay? Or joy and inspiration? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you're already serving at the centre, you know? So yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're doing a lot of For service. Sure. So. Yes, yes. We just posted. <laughs> it's your touch, you, so. I mean, it's not yeah. easy. It's not easy. Service is a big purification. <laughs> big, big purification. But yeah. the, joy, the joy and inspiration come from serving the teachers and... Yes. So seeing how um the teaching make a big difference for people. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's an inspiration. Yeah. So we need both, you know, we need to keep developing. And this is what I'm going to go into next, actually, how we keep doing that. But you know, as Bay said, through service, and especially when you find the service nourishing. I mean, of course, it's not always um, easy. There's a lot of challenges working with people and, you know, everybody and their spiritual expectations and <laughs> expectation. That's always hard. That's a practice. But there's also a lot of joy and inspiration in it as well. Um, so this is, um, yeah, this is next one. This is basically a little bit renunciation, you know, by renouncing samsara, Samsara is, so what's samsara? Ruth, what's your understanding of samsara? It's the continuing um, death and rebirth into other entities, you know, into another being um, and the suffering that comes with that. Yes, yeah. Urs, what's your understanding of samsara? Well, it's our current state. I mean, that we are not really free, but we're under the control of ignorance and, and karma. So we don't have really control over our destiny, our next life. So it's it's kind of like you're blown around by this these winds of karma and delusions. Yeah. There's actually a more, and no, it's right. This is all like summing up, you know, what it is. And and, I'm, and another level what it is, is what we just look, sort of briefly looked at in the, I think the first, last class. It's the, 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 the cycle of the contaminated aggregates. It's this constant. Thing from um, life to life, you know, this continuous cycling of what we call the five aggregates, body and mind for life to life. So it's a little bit, but basically it's summing up and the five aggregates are controlled by karma and delusion. So we have, even when we get enlightened, we're going to have five aggregates. We're going to have form. A Buddha has the aggregate form, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness. So even a Buddha has those five aggregates. But our five aggregates are under the control of karma and delusion. They're contaminated by karma and delusion. So it's the it's the cycling of those five aggregates um, that's really which, which is is samsara. You know, the contaminated aggregates taking rebirth again and again and not not being liberated for that. So what we wanted to achieve is these five pure aggregates of the Buddha, these five aggregates completely purified of the stains of karma and delusion and fully developed, the consciousness um, fully developed into, um, you know, wisdom, fully developed wisdom and compassion, sangye. Uh, sangye, Rimshel always used to talk about this term sangye, you know, it means um, fully developed. The Buddha's um, fully developed every single potential for wisdom and compassion. So right now, yeah, by renouncing our existence of contaminated cycling um, of car uh, caused by karma and delusion, we renounce our grass uh, we renounce the grasping, which comes from grasping, grasping what? 
ours? What are we grasping? Mainly. What's the main grasping that's going on? Oh, the, the main grasping. I mean, mm -hmm. we grasp it ourselves, that, that you know, our, yeah. our ego, the, yeah, the, the me, the I. Yeah, the wrong view, or we could say the wrong view self. Because the thing is, it's not, I mean, again, this takes a while, but it's not that we don't exist. You know, we do exist. confused you know is wrong mistaken so it's um, emptiness which is the nature of reality you know the, the ultimate nature of ourselves in reality is not nothing it's not nothingness it's um, simply um, expressing like a, a, a lack of inherent existence of self we don't exist in an uh, independent self-existent way so what we are trying to do is remove or Free yourself for the grasping of the wrong view of self, which creates unhappy minds and embrace our potential for it. So it's two things here with samsara, you know. It's not just like, oh, we need to get out of suffering and it's all depressing, you know. <laughs> it's like also it's like embracing and thinking, wow, this is what I'm talking about, the joy, you know. Wow, I've got this potential for enlightenment, though. So it's like on the one hand, we have the suffering and we have the unhappy mind, the grasping, and we need to, um, you know, unwire ourselves, get ourselves out of that. But on the other hand, it's like this is where the inspiration and joy, we need to feel that, especially as Westerners. We have this incredible potential for enlightenment, as we see in these great masters who are on this in this world, like His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and many, many great masters in the Tibetan tradition, I'm sure in other traditions as freedom right now to kind of um, awaken that potential. So, just uh, we went through the Four Noble Truths. So this is what how Rinpoche used to kind of term it. There's other ways of terming it. As we go through the Discovering Buddhism series, you know, there's other ways of kind of looking at the three levels of um, beings, you know, the three different capabilities of beings. That's one way of kind of starting to um, enumerate the spiritual path. Where do we start and how do we go? You know, how do we set off? So another way Rimshu used to express it is um, identifying the three types of spiritual happinesses that we're trying to work towards. What are our goals on the path? You know, as a spiritual being, it's not like we're trying to get into this state or that state or this one. You know, it's more about find what kind of levels of happiness and spiritual development are we trying to attain as we move along? So the first one is, and again, we go back to the wheel of life in a way, you know, the first thing we're trying to create because we're under the control of karma right now. Right. So we're creating actions where body, speech and mind all the time. We're creating a reality where minds that, that you know everyone's motivated all our actions are motivated by what's going on in our mind the level of our mind and then that those actions whether it's created with our body we are speech in our mind they're constantly creating karma this is a cycle we're creating karma 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 all the time and that karma is creating our future lives it's the karma there's an expression which i think probably you might have all heard, or at least a couple you might have heard. If you want to know what was your previous life, what would, what did you do in your last life or your last few lives? Look at you. What what's going on in this life? What's your karma this life? Hear yeah, that? You know, when you understand the basics of the teachings on karma, just that alone. If you look at your, you know, you can start to understand, okay, if I look at this life, I must have done this, that, and the next thing in my past lives. Because look at my life, this life. So I would say for most of us here, you know, living in this area, it, you know, we've met the Dharma, we have spiritual interest, we have a very, you know, we have a good, we're living in a country where there's peace right now. You know, we have a, we have a human body, we have human intelligence, we have... You know, we're all very, very fortunate, you know. So, wow, pat ourselves on the back, you know. Well done. <laughs> we have done some good stuff in our past life. 
We don't need to see past lives to infer that. Again, especially more as we study karma, which will come up in the Discovering Buddhism series. There's a whole four or five week module on karma. So as the more we study that, and some of us have already, the more we can say, well, wow, you know, I've done some good stuff in my past life. Okay, I have problems this life. It's not that we don't, but generally speaking, I've projected myself into, as we see in the Wheel of Life, the higher, the, you know, the better part of the spokes, you know, the higher part. I'm in the human realm. And not only that, I'm in a, a situation where I have, I'm living in a peaceful country. That's rare. You know, <laughs> I'm living in a country right now where I'm able to sp practice a spiritual path that I choose. That's quite rare, really. I mean, I you know, Geshe Tashi, who visited, um, he visited, uh, he taught, you know, on the weekend, and Bay was there as well. He came to visit Vajrapani um, on after the weekend, after the talk on Saturday. He came and had a quick walk around. It was raining, so he didn't see everything, but we had a nice tea together. Bay was the driver. She was doing a lot of driving that day. And Geshe, I was asking him about Tibet because he escaped from Tibet when he was 17. He was a monk and he said he escaped from Tibet with a few other people because they just didn't get the studies. There's not the teachers there anymore, you know, and the study is very controlled, you know, in Tibet. And he said that even in Tibet now, I mean, I didn't realise it was so bad. Available, they all have to download, everybody who has a cell phone has to download an app on their phone so the government can hear, hear, see everything that's going on on their phone. They also have in their houses these small um, kind of like camera things, you know, in the house. So everybody's got that in their house. So they can see, the government can see everything that's going on in their lives. Do you remember that book? Did anybody read that book? I think I saw the movie. Or I think I read the book actually at school, 1984. Yeah. I mean, that's what Tibet's going through right now. You know, they have no freedom, very limited freedom of speech. Even the religious freedoms are very limited. And there's other countries like that as well. I mean, South uh, North Korea is terrible, you know. So, um, but even Tibet, you know, I mean, this country that was so, had a, such a rich spiritual lineage that we're enjoying right now, we're benefiting from right now. But in their country, yeah, they can chant mantra, they can do some basic prayers, but they are not, if they mention the Dalai Lama, they'll get put in prison. You know, you're not allowed to even mention the name, you know. And because it's so censored um, in the, you know, um, around the public areas and the housing, on the phones, you know, they're not, they can't even mention his name, you know, they can't have a picture. So, I mean, of course, that this Tibetans have to accept it's through the power of karma, you know, that that's happened to that country. And So anyway, this is um, this is because yeah. So going back, you know, so if we without having any clairvoyance, <laughs> we can already deduce through understanding the teachings of karma and having some conviction in that that uh, we did a lot of good things in our past life, and that's something to be very feel that very fortunate. That's a source of inspiration for us, you know, a source of rejoicing. Similarly. Um, we could, without having clairvoyance <laughs> and maybe without at the moment having complete control over the death process, you know, we don't have, we haven't realized emptiness. We haven't completely eliminated all the delusions on the mind, but we can, through understanding karma, create causes for a few, good karma for our future lives. We can definitely have, I mean, we have to, we have to take some responsibility and create the causes for a good future rebirth by creating certain good karmas in our life, by practicing dharma, by practicing, you know, and I'll go through this more yeah, a little bit more, how we create happiness for future lives. But this is basically, you know, we can already have an idea of where we're going to get reborn by seeing what we're creating in this life. Have you have you heard that before? Urs? That expression? Yeah. I'm sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've heard this idea before, yeah. 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 So it's already we don't have we don't have any clairvoyant abilities. We haven't realized emptiness, but self, you know, identifying how we can 
we haven't completely controlled the delusions, eliminated the delusions, but we can already, uh, it's called the smaller, it's the kind of the spiritual being with a smaller capability. We can create happiness ourselves through basically observing good karma and there's different things you can do. You know, we can, we can do that now. We won't get out, you know, we're not going to be like the Buddha out of the wheel, but we can start, this is the first level of spiritual happiness as we go through the Lam Rim, the gradual path to enlightenment. And basically what Lama Zoparimshi and Kajala always say is, um, if you live your life with a good heart, I mean, really sincere good heart, and you're not generally overpowered too much with the delusions, you know, with especially strong anger, and we have a good sense of loving kindness and compassion for others. Generally speaking, that will create, you know, the first level of spiritual happiness, a good future rebirth. Because that's the first aim on this path, you know. It's not about <laughs> it's not about getting happy this life. But the thing is, if you start to create have a, if you have a good heart, people with a good heart are generally happy. You know, people who have are kind are generally they have more peaceful, happy minds, you know. So even without attempting to do any kind of elaborate practice, just basically practicing a good heart, kindness, that's already creating a good foundation for future life's happiness. That's the first level of spiritual being, someone with a good heart. So that's kind of what we call the first, you know, the first level of happiness. The second level of spiritual happiness, which is when we go into more of the middle scope in the Lam Rim, the gradual path to enlightenment, that's when we're trying to achieve what we call the happiness and peace of liberation. So this is where we're digging in more deeply to the delusions and the nature of suffering, trying to investigate it and really create more of the antidotes in our mind, and especially working more on how do we develop the wisdom that realizes emptiness. You know, we're trying to really work more into that, you know. Um, and that's very, again, that's very particular to the Buddhist teachings. So, Emma, do you have somebody had a question there? Had a comment? No. no. More deeply into this practice of bodhicitta, you know, developing not only our, our ability to achieve, get out of samsara ourself, to get out of this cycle, as you said, both said of birth and death, of the contaminated aggregates, but also to, to fully, there's a, a deeper level of obscuration, subtle obscuration, that's a kind of form of self-absorption, self-cherishing, that we need to also eliminate for the mind. And we do that by practicing the Bodhisattva path, the six perfections. And that results in the complete totality of our enlightenment, you know, our fully enlightened state. So, so this is, you know, this is what we're trying to do on this path. As you all, I know, I know some of you are aware of, but we just keep reminding ourselves, how do we keep, how do we kind of juggle all these balls? You know, how do we keep working with, you know, de definitely the foundational, I need to, if I love myself, <laughs> You know, there's a lot of talk about self-love in different traditions. You know, I love myself, so I'm doing this. I love myself, so I'm doing that. What the Buddhists would say, if you love yourself, first of all, create good karma. Be a good person. Be a kind person. Create the happiness of your future lives. Because without a human rebirth, if we get born in the other states, it's much more difficult to help each other and it's much more difficult to develop. You know, so we want a human rebirth and we also want a rebirth where we have access to spiritual teachers, teachings, we have faith in the Dharma, you know, spiritual life, and we're gradually, gradually just developing on the spiritual path. So it's a very wise and skillful way of approaching the spiritual path. I find it very grounded. <laughs> it's not somewhere up there in Airy Fairy where we're trying to get into certain states of mind. Yes, we, we are doing that. But it's actually very, very grounded, you know, and that's what I really appreciate about the Buddhist teachings, you know, in this particular tradition. It's like, it's it, you know, the more we think about it and reflect and it's very, it becomes more clean, clear what we need to do. It's a step by step process. It's a harder one to get, you know, but we have to keep chipping away at that, you know, and working on that. 
And of course, full enlightenment is also difficult as well. So, I mean, the practices are set up in this tradition. So we're chipping away and working at all of these three different things in the one time, you know, ideally. Any questions, comments? We're okay. We're all good. <laughs> um, Namasya, if this makes some sense to you, is it familiar from anything you've heard before? Yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah. Foundation of everything that <laughs> said. Yeah. Good. So where do we start? We start on the very you know, there's three three body cheetah and emptiness. So these are called the But as I'm, I'm sorry, you're, you're um, cutting out a lot. I didn't hear anything. Oh, that you sorry. Said. So um, am I cutting out quite a bit on this? Yep. So it's not any better down here than it was up, up in my house. It seems almost uh, worse. Or okay. I'm going to try and see. I'll try again next week. Sorry about that. If I can find somewhere even better, I might need to sit right next to the, you know, right next to the router down here. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, I've got the slides then, so at least you can always sit and read them, you know, when I've got now. So basically, yeah, where we start, and already I did start to speak about this, is really getting a, and certainly I can see when I start to feel lazy, <laughs> and believe you me, that's more than it should be, <laughs> Um. What really, really brings me back, I mean, certainly being in the presence of a spiritual master, you know, when we see, when we get to see the gurus, you know, I mean, His Holiness Ling Rinpoche is coming. Are, are, who's, um, are, are you planning all to go? Oh, well, Urs, you won't be here. You're not, I keep forgetting you're not here. Namasya, you got any, did you hear his, Ruth and Namasya, did you hear His Holiness Ling Rinpoche is coming this year to the Bay Area? I didn't hear, no. Well, you'll see on, I'm sure it's on Ocean of Compassion's website. He's coming on the 25th, 26th of May. And he's an, he's an already, um, I think he's the eighth Ling Rinpoche, the eighth incarnation of the same master, you know, who's come back eighth time. I think it's the eighth incarnation. And so he's also, he was also in his previous life, he was a teacher of the Dalai Lama. So when the Dalai Lama was very young, he was already in his previous life, you know, and he was a great master in his previous life. So he was one of the main tutors of the Dalai Lama when he was, you know, a young boy, you know, he tutored him up um, from a young age to develop his um, sort of Geshe degree and all his education, you know, so that was what he happened in this life. So of course, when he's, he's holding it, the previous Ling Rinpoche passed away in 1985. And then was, I think it was 83, 84, 85, mid eighties. And then again, came back into this uh, realm and was recognized as the previous Ling, Ling, Ling Rinpoche. So now he's completed his studies. And again, he was guided by the Dalai Lama in this life. They're very close. And he's now around 38, So he's one of these younger llamas that's um, again coming in and he's a, uh, he came here, was it two, three years ago? He was here the last I think I got 18. Here, and he's giving an initiation and some teachings on the Lam Rim, you know, of this, you know, these topics. So it's something to consider. It would be, it's in San Jose, isn't it, Bay? The You've got the venue? Oh, uh, yes. We reserve tentative for, well, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like Mexican so, Heritage Plaza. Yeah, anyway, it's, it's, it's in the area there. And it's so, so again, this is, so how do we, you know, we have to think it, because it's not easy to kind of keep going with these. <laughs> you know, it's not easy to get ourselves out of suffering. I mean, if it was, we would be out of suffering already, yeah? <laughs> we wouldn't still be coming from limitless lives back, you know, beginningless lives. It's a hard job. It's a tough job. But the more we recognise it and the more we make 
small impacts on our minds, the more we see this is worthwhile. You know, I need to get myself out of this. Otherwise, again, I'm continually reincarnating. So one of the, yeah, certainly a major inspiration um, for, our, for us in our practice is, you know, going to teachings together with others, listening to teachers from inspiring teachers, and especially these kinds of holy beings, you know, these great beings who embody the qualities of these teachings. They, they, they've, they've developed them, you know, at least to a very high level, you know. So um, so just to advertise that, His Holiness Ling Rinpoche will be coming to the area. But I guess, I guess Urs, you can listen online, you know. I'm sure it'll be available on Zoom. So that's a great, a great way to gain inspiration, being in the presence of teachers and teachings and especially great masters. So I would really um, encourage you if you have the opportunity to be able to attend that. It would be wonderful. Maybe Earth has to fly here because the um the initiation is it's only in person. Oh, but the teaching is online though. The, the teaching, teaching oh yes, the is on, online, but the the yeah. Sunday, uh, uh initiation is um is yeah. in person. Yeah. So what anyway, initiation is he doing? Do you know? Uh, uh thousand arm chin racing. So that's a wonderful one, of course, for developing compassion, chanting Omani Pebmi Home. Um, perhaps after that, Bay, you can offer the practice, you know, there's a really nice Chen Rizig practice that could be offered at the centre or something. Some people might be interested to do that, you know, to, to, right after the initiation. Um, would you leave that? <laughs> I, I would be happy to do that. I love that okay. practice, you know. Okay. I was thinking of mentioning it. I thought I'll just say it to you now while it's in my mind. Otherwise, I kept I keep meaning to say it. But it's a very it's very good when you receive the initiation to kind of start it quite soon after because you've got this energy, you know, you've received yeah. this blessing of the practice. And so these kind of practices really help to support our practice of the lamb rim. You know, we really need a good um, daily practice of kind of mantra, either Shakyamuni, it's what we call a guru yoga practice. It can be Shakyamuni Buddha practice. It can be you know, give a, a good, good the mind a good blast. It's kind of enlightened potential, you know. It wakes up the mind so we're able to see more deeply what's going on in the mind, you know. They purify the mind, they purify the delusions in the mind, and they also help us to see the delusions in the mind, you know. So then we're like, okay, I can see it now, and now I need to just keep working on it, you know, because we have to be able to really see what's, you know, really get gain some insight into like the workings of the mind, you know, and how they're creating suffering. And that's where the inspiration really comes to keep practicing. So yeah, being in the presence of holy masters, and just to touch on this, and maybe we go into a little bit more next week, just starting again with the preciousness of human life. This is like, it's even something they say, it's part of the Lamrim, but in some texts, it's like a preliminary to the path to enlightenment, is reflecting on how fortunate we are as a human being. Not just a human being, understanding being able to understand karma some ability to know that we are the creator of our actions in our world you know and we have to take responsibility for our actions because we're creating what's going on in the future in our life so again that's just really touching on that i probably i think we don't have time now so i think what we'll do is um I want to uh, talk just a wee bit more about precious human life next week and death because these two things are what really, um, certainly, as I say, for me, when I'm feeling um, a little bit like, yeah, lazy or, you know, ordinary, or if I just try to, if I start to think about how much, how fortunate my situation is, I mean, you just need to turn on the news and you feel like that a little bit these days, you know? You just need to read the news and you can already feel like, gosh, I'm so lucky. I mean, not to, you know, you feel lucky. And what it also does is it makes you feel Compat, you know, you feel compassion for others, especially the more you think a wee bit more deeply about the preciousness of human life. It's like you really feel like, gosh, I have this very, very fortunate situation right now, you know, to be able to, as I say, compared to the Tibetan people, they have a lot of faith in their tradition 
in this lineage, but they have a limitation on what they can practice and study right now because of the control of the Chinese government. Um, as other countries do, you know, their, their, their religion, their politics, it's very, very controlled. So we have, you know, even though, <laughs> as we all know, the political situation in all our countries isn't perfect, <laughs> there's still levels of corruption. But it's not corrupt to the point where we don't have certain freedoms and abilities, you know, to make our decisions and guide our life and, you know, practice um, our own religion and path, you know. So that's just a, a slight touch of what's going on with precious human life. So it's it's important, I think, um, yeah, as a, as a, you know, as a, as a, a source of energy and inspiration, we need to feel this sense of being very fortunate. When we feel fortunate, it's like, yeah, it just gives us sort of joy and happiness, you know, because a lot of time as a human, we don't, humans, we don't feel fortunate. <laughs> the way society set up and also the way we're sort of wired off and maybe not where in the masia, because you teach your system of teaching for children is quite different, you know. So I think it's a more, I would imagine it's a more healthy way of children trying to connect with their goodness, you know, the goodness in their heart. But mostly in Western culture, as you know, when we're in education, we're not educated to to start off from a place of feeling very fortunate in our lives. You know, we're usually started off where we just learn this and that and the next thing, and then we have to strive and goals and aims, and they're all very external. You know, so so feeling starting to have a healthy sense of good fortune isn't it's just not in there in an education, unless the families provide it you know so i think in this path in this spiritual path feeling a sense of good fortune and gratitude we get that through the reflection on precious human life if you really do it you know and that's what i think that's a very very solid foundation because i have heard some teachers say oh you know in the buddhist path you know in the buddhist tradition in the lamb you feel great but actually it's very much there in the very preliminary teaching of feeling a uh, fortunate for a precious human life you know and and we have to work on that we have to keep reminding ourselves our good fortune so next week i'll just go through the basic point you know the basic points on that and we'll just reflect a little bit on it just to because we do we have to keep going through you know what is it that i'm fortunate for we know we're fortunate that we're not in a you know some of these war-torn poor impoverished countries but there's other reasons why we're fortunate as well so when we think of each one it's supposed to bring about a sense of kind of joy and good fortune but we, as i say we have to kind of reflect on them more deeply and then that in the light of also the fragility of life like we don't know when we're going to die those two things together are supposed to be kind of the most the main motivating factors on our spiritual path you know the main sources that bring energy so if we know how to meditate and reflect on them it does it sort of ignites the mind into practice you know inspires it fuels the mind into practice that's the idea <laughs> so that's um that's a uh, yeah so we'll just uh, touch a wee bit more on them as, as most of you know already you know but we just remind ourselves next week again and then, you know, hopefully, because there's only two more classes, we'll do that. And then just touch a little bit again on the other two happinesses. How, you know, what what's really the main key elements for the happiness of liberation and also what brings us to the happiness of full enlightenment. And again, this is just giving us a little bit of an idea of what we're going to go into in much more detail as uh, Venerable Yonten. And a few of us different nuns. <laughs> there's going to be three or four nuns who are going to be teaching the discovering Buddhism class, you know, more detail, going into these topics in more detail. Anybody questions, comments? No? Okay, so let's just take a moment to just um, settle our mind, you know, just take a moment to think about what, you know, what, what we discussed tonight and maybe what you can just bring away with you um, for the week to think about, reflect on, something that might inspire you or something you're curious about that you just want to think about a bit more, you know, reflect on a bit more or go away and read on a bit more as the way, as you go through your week. Just take that with you. 
put it in your pocket, take it away with you and then take it out maybe sometime in the week or tomorrow morning and as you're doing reflection, just, um, you know, hold that with you. And I will put out up the de dedication prayers that we usually do. Cheers. Dedicate the positive energy here. Now, get the page number. If it's around, maybe let's try. I can't quite remember the page number, so we'll try this. <laughs> Let me see, where are we? Let's... Sorry, I need to go back to the beginning. Get the page. Dedication prayers. Okay, 199. So we to dedicate, so we always did. Which is possible, mainly, you know, to develop the good heart on top of the good heart, to develop these credible, noble qualities, the patience, generosity, joyous effort. That's kind of the essence of bodhicitta, eh, morality these different levels of mind, you know, that bring about the accomplishment of bodhicitta, the limitless good heart. May I and all beings be able to actualize, develop this in their heart and mind. Chanchu senchu rimbo she magye panam ge gyur she ge ba nyam ba me ba ye Gone, gone, do pelwar shog. May the precious supreme body cheetah not yet born arise. May that arisen not decline, but increase more and more. Let me see. And um, we'll just pray for His Holiness's long life as well. O gan ri ra we kor we jingam dir pendan de wa ma lu jing we ne chen re zi wan zen zing ya zo ye sha pe si te ba du deng yur chi in the land encircled by snow mountains you're the source of all happiness and good all powerful chen re zi ten zing ya zo Please remain until samsara ends. Okay, good night. Thank you so much. <laughs> Have a good week. Have an inspiring week. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 <laughs>